Well, thank you everybody for coming for this next talk in the series. Uh, I'll be talking today about what is evolution. So many of you already have an idea of what evolution is. Many of you have some ideas, you know, from some you know hardcore scientific readings, from popular press, etc. But I want to actually give kind of a broad talk. I'll divide my talk into three sections. First part will be about what is evolution and why is it that there's some discussion about this, especially in the, in the general public. There's no debate in the, in, the, in the scientific field at all. Second, what is the evidence for evolution? How do we know that this has happened? Why is this so broadly accepted? And last, why should you care? I, I put why should I care, but it's really about why you should care. So we'll talk about you know, medical relevance of understanding evolution and how we really get to understand a lot more about ourselves by applying evolutionary concepts to address important questions. Okay? So with that, let's dive right in. So what is evolution? Evolution can be very simply defined as change through time. Change through time. That's really all it is. It sounds like it's something fairly complex, but it's very straightforward. The important facet here I want to emphasize is this is time over generations. I did not evolve from a baby. I was born a baby, and I developed over time. That's what change within an individual is. But change over generations, that is evolution. That's the distinction between those two things. Now, one cause of evolution is natural selection. Some people tend to define evolution as natural selection, but that's not true at all. Just one potential factor which can drive evolution is natural selection. It's most certainly not the only one. Now I'm going to ask a very obvious question. Does anybody know why these moths are drawn here in the corner? Yes? That's exactly correct. Let me, I'm going to go ahead and tell that whole story a little bit elaborate, but you're exactly correct. So the classic example of evolution by natural selection, this is one that, that comes up a lot uh, just because it's so elegant and it's something that's seen over human lifetimes, is that of the peppered moth. The, the species name is Biston betularia. If you go back to you know, the early 1800s, all moths were peppered in color. So there's one right here. You can barely see it on the tree. You see where I'm circling there? I'll switch and use the pointer. Maybe you can see a little better, too. There, there is a standard pepper moth. And you notice you can barely see it on that lichen-covered tree. In fact, birds can also barely see it on that lichen-covered tree, and that's why it actually survived for a long time. Right around the mid-1800s, we had the Industrial Revolution. We had lots of smokestacks going up all over the place. This was studied, by the way, most extensively in Great Britain, but a very similar pattern also happened in the United States and in Japan as well. And over this time, the trees were blackened and the lichens were killed. So what ended up happening is this guy right here, who's nice and cryptic on a, on a lichen-covered uh, uh, log, all of a sudden is very apparent on a black log. And what you had happen is there was a mutation to black which arose in that time. You never saw black moss before 1848. And nobody had ever seen one of this particular species, that is. Uh, by 1895, 98% of the species were black. This is actually a single gene change. Just one gene change made this moth change from uh, from peppered color to black color. So by 1895, you went from all peppered to all black. And this is referred to as industrial melanism. Now, this is just one example of industrial melanism. In fact, this actually happened in quite an array of insects and other animals. Now, what's great about this particular example isn't just this change from 1848 to 1895, but it's actually one that we saw go both ways. So let me show you the other half of the story, which sometimes gets missed. There we go. So again, 1895, 98% of the moths were black. We had this industrial melanism going on. Well, air pollution is obviously a bad thing. This was, took something, uh, some time for people to realize. And one of the best illustrations of this was the Great Smog of 1952. Anybody ever heard of this before? When I was researching this, I had never heard of this before. So this was just like a year ago I discovered this. Some of you knew about this, yeah. So this was awful. This was this thing that happened, uh, especially in London, where air patterns changed. And basically, the smog that was being produced didn't blow away over to France like it usually did. It just sat there <laughs> over London and over Britain. And it was so bad. This is, this is an actual picture from the time where you literally just couldn't see through the smog. Many people, especially people who had um, pulmonary conditions already, started to die. They actually closed down hospitals. This was a horrible, horrible thing. Needless to say, as is typical, the only time you can get politicians to act is when you have something like this happen. So Clean Air Acts immediately followed this to say, well, okay, maybe we shouldn't be poisoning ourselves and our environment. So you had these Clean Air Acts passed in 1956 and another set in 1968. 
The circle lines there show the frequency of moths over time. The years are, are here on the bottom, so it's 1959 to 1995. The circles, not, not the, the dark ones, but the open circles, are the fraction of moths collected each year that were black. So notice they're right around 1959, they're 90, 92 or 93 percent black. See this gradual decline. So this is go just going to 1995, where they're only about 10 percent black. It's actually been continued. If you go to now, and I think the most recent survey was 2003 or 2004, something like two or three percent of the moths are black. Simultaneously, you're seeing the lichens coming back on the trees. You know, you don't have these blackened trees everywhere. This is an elegant example of evolution by natural selection going two ways. First, the environment changed one way. Light, uh, the peppered color was not favored and black was favored. Then it changed the other way, where black was no longer favored and you went back to the original condition. These black filled dots are exactly the same thing happening in the United States. So this was a case where we actually saw parallel experiments happening in both Great Britain and in the United States with exactly the same outcome. Isn't that pretty dramatic? So this is the reason this example always comes up in the evolution literature is, look, here's evolution happening, and this is happening over a reasonable lifetime here. This is from 1959 to 1995. Many people here in this room were alive through that whole period. You probably weren't out there collecting moths, but <laughs> you could have been in theory, and you, may, you would have observed exactly this pattern going on. So this is a really cool example. Now, a lot of people out there say, well, natural, uh, evolution by natural selection is just a theory. This is what people toss back all the time. It's just a theory. So I want to give you a mathematical example to show you that this is mathematically inevitable. There is no way you cannot have evolution by natural selection with a set of conditions. So let's, so let's imagine there's two types of squirrels. Let's say there's one type that runs randomly. And as you can imagine, this is the outcome quite frequently. <laughs> and let's say that you have a, another type of squirrel that fears asphalt, who you know get to survive and pass on their genes. Okay, so these are two types of squirrels. We're gonna we're gonna put some simplifying assumptions here just to just to make the the math a little bit clear. We're going to assume that these are basically just give birth themselves without having to mate, and they produce something just like themselves. So it, it's similar, but it's basically we're putting in heredity. So we're saying the type A on average have one offspring and then they die. So after one generation. You know, the original parents are gone, and the offspring are, still, or the offspring are there, but they produce exactly the same number. So it would be 100. Generation 2, again 100. Generation 3, again 100. Okay? Very simple illustration. Now, what's going on here with type B? These are ones that have two offspring. So in generation 1, how many would, should we see? 200. How about generation 2? 400. That's good. Actually, my class always says 300. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Maturation three, 800. Very good. So what has happened to the fraction of squirrels of type B? Well, we start off with 50%. Here we're at 66%. Sorry, my handwriting's a little bad. Here we're at 80%. Here we're at about 89%. This is evolution by natural selection. There's no implied morality here. This is just a byproduct of differential survival and having a heritable basis to that. That's all evolution by natural selection needs. When you have those two things, evolution by natural selection is a mathematical inevitability. There's no way you can avoid it happening as long as you have those two features going on. Yeah? Any questions on that? Feel free, by the way, to interrupt me anytime with questions. This is, I purposely didn't put a ton of slides because I want to make this as dialogue-like as possible. Now, nonetheless, despite what I just showed you, you know, we have elegant examples, both hypothetical, mathematical, and actual. People feel this is contentious, or at least some people feel it's contentious, and in some, some places it's not. I gave a talk uh, last month at the University of Texas at Arlington to a bunch of students there. Yeah. So actually, th th the answer is going to be a little surprising here. <laughs> there was one student in the, who was sitting right next to me, and I said something like, why is there so much uh, contentiousness over evolution? She's like, what contentiousness? I was like, where are you from? Spain. Ah, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but it's funny to her, this was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> but needless to say, for the rest of them, they definitely felt it was contentious. So let me ask you all these questions. And you know, don't necessarily answer them, but think about them for just a second. Are there flaws with the concept of evolution or evolution by natural selection? Think about that for just a second, and we'll, we'll come back to that. Are there holes in the evidence? And last but not least, are there contradictions with respect to facts that you know from elsewhere? These are the things that should make it contentious, right? Yeah? Hmm? 
Epigenetics, not so much. So this comes up a lot, actually, in, in recent talks. People will say, what about epigenetics? Epigenetics is basically just a different form of inheritance, though it's often a little bit less stable. So it doesn't usually change, like uh, at least not in a fundamental way. It doesn't usually change any of the types of things we're talking about. If it's stably inherited, it actually works just the same as if it was genetic inheritance. If it's not stably inherited, then it doesn't even matter. So that, that's a very good question. But that, that question does come up quite a bit. Pardon me? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's okay. So uh, we can talk about that uh, towards the end. So the question was, uh, what are there some epigenetic effects that are essentially Lamarckian? And I actually have written about that topic exactly, so that's one thing I actually do know about. But um, it appears that way, but it's not exactly the same. Yeah. We'll come back to that towards the end. Yeah. Talk slower. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I get excited. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll try to do that. So let's go through some of this. Now, history has the tendency to repeat itself. So if you go back, I'm just going to give you a quick history thing. In 1925, many of you are familiar with the, the so-called Scopes Monkey Trial. So John Scopes was a teacher in Tennessee. I don't remember exactly which city. And he was instructed that he was not supposed to teach evolution, at least standard Darwinian evolution, because this was bad. He defied the, the school board or authorities or whatever and was immediately taken into custody and said, okay, well, we're going to have a trial about this. There was a big trial. William Jennings Bryan, the famous orator and, and former uh, presidential candidate, actually came to speak on behalf of the prosecution, which was really a shame because I mean, he was somebody who there was a lot of respect for in the community and things like that. And this really pushed his career down because of the stance he took. Uh, Clarence Darrow spoke for the defense. And, pardon me? Oh, I thought there was a question. Um, they essentially went through the full trial, and what happened, as you all know, is that they actually did find him guilty because he actually did defy the law. However, they gave him a penalty of, I forget it was one dollar or one cent or something like that, because they said this was completely ridiculous. Yes, you defied it, so we can't actually say you're not guilty, but that was completely ridiculous. Essentially, it trivialized the entire thing. So you say, well, 1925, how many years ago was that? That was like 90 years ago, or I forget exactly. Huh? He, he did keep his job. <laughs> 2005, 80 years later, we have almost the same sort of thing happening. We have the Dover, Pennsylvania School Board says you must teach intelligent design alongside Darwinian evolution. We had some, te uh, some both teachers and parents complained. Uh, various big or organizations got involved on behalf of the uh, on behalf of the intelligent design side, the Discovery Institute funneled in lots of money and quote unquote experts to come in and say, no, no, really, this is, this is a valid scientific theory. In contrast, the National Center for Science Education in the United States uh, funded several people to come speak on, on getting rid of this requirement. So one of the people was Robert Pennock from Michigan State University. The judge ruled, as it says right here, intelligent design is not science. So this is really not the case. And I'll read you uh, one of the, the headlines on there. It says. We have addressed the seminal question of whether intelligent design is science. We have concluded that it is not, and moreover, that intelligent design cannot uncouple itself from its creationist and thus religious antecedents. And he actually was very critical about the fact that this was pushed on top of all the science teachers, that they would have to teach this alongside Darwinian evolution. So why is there still this debate? Why do we keep coming back to this? I mean, Darwin wrote his book in 1859, and we're still talking about it. Well, this shows you results from a survey from 2005 about uh, acceptance of evolution and rejection of evolution. So the blue bars here on, on the left side of that long chart, the blue bars are people who when asked said evolution was quote unquote true. The red bars are ones who said it was false and the kind of beige bars there are ones who said it was unsure. So I'll read you what some of the numbers or what some of the individuals are. So Iceland had the highest acceptance of evolution where it was something like 80% accepted, 10% not sure, and 10% said false. You have Denmark, Sweden, France, Japan, and UK are all very high. In the middle, we have you know, Slovenia, Finland, Czech Republic, Estonia. Near the bottom, actually second from the bottom, is the United States. 40% said evolution is true, 40% said false, and 20% unsure. Turkey was below it. So, <laughs> so it, the United States surprisingly shows both one of the highest rates of disbelief in evolution and one of the lowest rates in belief of, of belief in evolution. Yeah. Maybe, maybe so. <laughs> maybe so. Now, you might think, well, 2005, that was a while back. Maybe things have improved in the last couple of years. Uh, no. <laughs> 2009, we got actually a little bit worse. When I say we, I'm referring, I know not everybody here is from the United States, but uh, when I say we, I'm referring to, to my home country there. So what's going on? Yeah.
Yeah, I think there. Are, I, I don't know the exact numbers, but I'm pretty sure that you're that you're exactly right. That we do actually see a rise from about the 1980s up. Not a dramatic rise, but a rise nonetheless. So that's unfortunate. Now I think part of this comes from some confusion about you know this idea that evolution is a theory. Now first, let me put out a couple of facts out there. Within the scientific community, there is no debate about the truth of evolution. Let me emphasize that there is no debate whatsoever. Nobody says, well, maybe it didn't happen. And this is true also among devout Christians. And, when, and many of you know that Pope John Paul II, for example, when he was Pope, said that, yes, we accept that evolution by natural selection happens. We fully accept this. There's no controversy to teach. This is the most common thing that anti-evolution people will say. Well, I'll teach the controversy and let the kids decide. I, l I love the comics that come out after that saying, like, alchemy versus chemistry. Teach the, teach the controversy. <laughs> things like that. <laughs> or astrology versus astronomy. Things like that. <laughs> Uh, again, th there are debates within the field of evolution, but it's very much not about whether it happened. It's about the relative importance of different forces, like how important is natural selection versus other evolutionary forces. The other thing is that evolution is a theory and a fact. And, and this is the kind of thing that a lot of, the, a lot of people in the general public, not this science, I mean, this is the scientific American readers, so you guys know this very well. But there's some confusion when you say a theory. Like I, I say, well, I have a theory that blah, 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 blah. But when you're saying this in general parlance, that's just, it's like saying a guess. I mean, there's not necessarily any basis for that whatsoever, or maybe some tiny basis. But a scientific theory, in contrast, is one where you've, where you've had hypotheses that have been verified and accepted to be true. So an example would be gravity, <laughs> you know, atoms, germs. I mean, germs are actually now more than a theory in that we've actually completely shown this. But there have been verified so many times, nobody doubts these things. Nobody says, well, if I jump off the side here, maybe I'll fly. Ah, darn, it didn't work. <laughs> But, you know, again, gravitational theory is, is nonetheless a theory that's been demonstrated several times. I'm glad that wasn't higher than it was. <laughs> so what is evolution? And again, I showed this slide last time, but just in case somebody missed it, I just wanted to just emphasize that evolution has two fundamental processes. We have change within a lineage, and this is exactly the same slide as last time, but I'll just go through this one re repeat slide. Change within a lineage such that, again, 60 million years ago, horses were about the size of dogs, stood about a half meter tall. But over time, you had this change from the ancestral form to this modern day form, which stands a meter and a half tall. Evolution also has not just change within a lineage, but formation of new lineages, which is the topic of my previous talk. That you know there was an ancestral horse-like form up here in time, and then going to the present day, you had you had recently a split between horses and zebras, and, and further back, a, a split between horse zebras and donkeys, where they all shared a common ancestor. Now, it's this common ancestry thing that always drives people nuts. The other thing is that, this is a, this is a quote from my PhD advisor, who also wrote an excellent book, by the way, about, uh, about evidence for evolution. Species general, generally seem to be, quote, in intricately and almost perfectly designed for living their lives. This is from his book called Why Evolution is True. I definitely recommend you get it. And I didn't tell you this, but if you, if you Google it, there's a Russian website that has it for free. <laughs> didn't tell you that. You didn't hear that. <laughs> but anyway, this is an e excellent book you should see. Now, it's this appearance of design that throws people off. Right? That everything seems like it's, it matches the environment just the way it should. Now, some adaptations did evolve in response to the physical environment, and we've talked about that in, in uh, my previous talk as well. But there's other adaptations that evolved in response to interaction with other species. Now, I want to show a quick video here about a really, really elegant example of an adaptation uh, in response to interactions with another species. Now, this is the case of the Lampsilis mussel, that mussel like, like a clam, right? It has this fish lure attached to it. This is not an actual fish, but this is literally just a lure that comes out of the mussel's mouth, and it waves it around and tries to get bass to come close. When bass come close, they spew their gametes out into, I'm sorry, not their gametes, their, uh, their young, into the, into the gills of the, of the bass. Those, those young will then latch onto the gills and suck the blood and grow up that way. It's really dramatic. I'll show you a video of this. Woe is right. <laughs> Might need to get the volume up for this part. Lives the Lampsilis mussel, a simple animal with an extraordinary life cycle. To reach adulthood, its young must spend part of their lives inside a fish, the largemouth bass. To get there, the mussels must make physical contact, a difficult task, 
as mussels don't swim. But the bass has a weakness. It's a voracious predator of small fish, particularly darters. Even the slightest wriggle of a darter's tail will attract bass. Believe it or not, the fish on the mussel is an imitation, a perfect replica that will lure bass within striking range. The mussel can somehow sense approaching fish and wriggles its lure faster to entice them. If it gets the twitching just right, the remarkable likeness should do the rest. On impact, the muscle squirts its young into the bass's mouth. These snap shut on the gills like spring-loaded traps. Here they stay drawing blood from the fish until several weeks later they drop off as tiny, fully formed muscles. <laughs> That's just... <laughs> That's just disturbing. <laughs> yeah. I don't know the answer to that. I, I'm sure they harm it, but I'm not sure if the if they actually kill it. I don't think so. I think they actually live. I think they live through it. But I'm sure, you know, they are losing blood in the process. Yeah, it's really dramatic, isn't it? Now, this is a case where, you know, if if one wants to see design there, it's very easy to see design there. Now, the, flips, the problem is that adaptation by natural selection gives almost always the same sort of signature as if something was designed. Now, what we have to try to do is we have to try to dig deeply to find uh, potential ways to distinguish them. And th that's actually what the next section of my talk is going to be. Basically, what are the basic principles of evolution and what is the evidence? How do we distinguish it from sort of a, a design, a truly intentional design? I'll talk about, you know, the example everybody always says, is what about cases of bad design? I'll have some of those in a, in a couple of minutes. So, two important principles of evolution. First, and this, is, this was uh, Darwin's genius to suggest this, all species share common ancestry as a result of splitting of lineages from one ancestral life form. So this picture up here just shows uh, the case of uh, primate evolution over time, but it shows a common ancestor down here at the bottom. There's your ancestral primate. And over time, you have these various splits where humans are here off to the right, and you, know, you have your chimp, your gorilla, et cetera, all these other things. The other facet is that much of this evolutionary change was caused by natural selection. This was something that Darwin emphasized repeatedly. He was not the person who introduced natural selection, but he suggested that a lot of the change comes from that. And this is the sole process that produces adaptation or the appearance of design. So what are some predictions from this? Well, first, if life originated on Earth, right, which we assume it did, as, as was discussed in Dr. Benton's talk the other day, and we have this evolution, then the first detectable forms of life should be extraordinarily simple. Right? That you can't immediately have something complex from nothing. And only later would you get these more complex forms, these more quote-unquote modern forms. There was a, a famous evolutionary biologist named J.B.S. Haldane, and his quote about this is, uh, when asked what would convince you that evolution didn't happen, he said, oh, if I saw a fossil rabbit in the Precambrian, I'd say, I'm wrong. Which, I mean, there are no fossil rabbits in the Precambrian, so he was right. <laughs> so what, what happens when we look at the record? Well, the record supports this idea perfectly, and, and you actually saw quite a bit of this in Dr. Benton's talk the other day. So if you go back... Uh, 3.8 billion years ago, here we had the origin of life, and we have, shortly after that, we have the earliest fossil records of life. These earliest fossil records were not rabbits, they were not lampsilis mussels, they were just extraordinarily simple, single-celled objects, right? They had very simple structures. You had, much later than that, you had the first shelled animals, much later than that, you had your first fish. This is actually jumping, by the way, quite a bit in time. Then you had, you know, the origins of reptiles, your mammals, uh, and then, you know, of course, we have, like, humans just coming in the, in the, in the last uh, couple of hundred thousand years. So we see exactly this pattern. The, the earliest forms are the simplest. Now, one thing I'll emphasize, too, is that people say, well, aren't bacteria pretty complicated? You have to remember that bacteria share a common ancestry with us. So they've also been evolving for 3.8 billion years, too. So modern bacteria is not going to be the same as that original form. That's a point I'll be making a little later in the talk, but I wanted to introduce it early on as well. Another prediction, 
If evolution occurred with the lineages, and, the, and those lineages are splitting at times, as we expect, then we should be able to find things gradually changing through the fossil record. And it doesn't have to be gradual. You can have slightly abrupt. It just can't be this you know, radical go from one thing to something extraordinarily more complicated. We should also sometimes see lineages splitting in the fossil record. And we should see these cases where there's two forms that are, that are actually co-occurring at the same time. And in fact, we see both of those things. And I actually showed you this example already, too, at some level. The fossil record for horses is extraordinarily good. And we see this gradual change over time. So look at this early form here, the dawn horse. It actually had uh, separate toes, very much like we have, right? So this is the, the ancestral form. And as you go over time, you had the fusion of all these things into the, into the, the standard hoof that you see in, in the modern horse. This wasn't there originally, but this is an example of this sort of gradual change. And you see it changing. There's an intermediate form. There's another kind of intermediate form. And this is kind of similar to what a lot of the ancestor, what other species are like. You also have various lineages which are co-occurring. So you have this, this lineage here is occurring alongside this lineage. This lineage here is occurring alongside this lineage. And if you go very recent, you, you would find you know, zebras alongside horses and donkeys alongside horses. So we have these splits happening just as you would predict. So this is exactly what's happening. Now, these are fairly simple predictions. We're going to go into some more complex and more interesting ones, but I want to put out the simple ones first. One other thing, if, if uh, you share a common ancestor, you should be able to find transitional fossils that connect modern-day animals to their ancestor. Now, let me show one more video. This is just a, this is just a, a, a comedy one, but it's, it's, it makes the point pretty well. This is the one where people always talk about, oh, aren't there so many missing links, etc. So here's the video for that. This is from the TV show Futurama. Oh! If your elitist East Coast evolution is real, why has no one found the missing link between modern humans and ancient apes? We did find it. It's called Homo erectus. Then you have proven my case, sir. For no one has found the link between apes and this Homo erectus. Yes, they have. It's called Homo habilis. Aha! But no one has found the missing link between ape and the so-called Homo habilis. Yes, they have. It's called Australopithecus africanus. Oh, ho, I've got you now. Fair enough. <laughs> but where, then, is the missing link between apes and this Darwinius massili? Answer me that, Professor. <laughs> Okay, granted, that one missing link is still missing. But just because we haven't found it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Push off! There you go. Does that illustrate the point pretty well? <laughs> That's good. That was just from a, from a regular TV show there. But it illustrates it exactly right. This is the kind of thing that comes up all the time when you're talking to people. What about all those missing links? What missing links? What are these missing links? Anyway. Here's one example that, that many of you know about. This is a feathered dinosaur. There's other cases, too, like Archaeopteryx. But this is sign, I forget how you say this, sign or nitho, I can't say it. There it is. <laughs> this is a feathered dinosaur. What's important about this one is it appears at the right time in the fossil record, right? That this shows up, you know, shortly before the origin of modern birds. You see this fossil. It's exactly in the right layer. And it, and it looks like what you would predict it to look like. It is this intermediate form between your reptile ancestors and modern birds. And here's an artist's depiction of what it might have looked like. It's a ghastly beast, isn't it? <laughs> but that's just one example. There's, there's always this discussion of missing links. And I, and I trivialized this a little bit yesterday by uh, suggesting, for example, between the crocodile and the duck, you might, you're missing that crocoduck still. But <laughs> this picture on the, on the right is a really important one. If you go back to, say, the 1960s, we, there actually were a lot of missing links between terrestrial mammals and these sort of oceanic mammals, things like the killer whale and dolphins and things like that. And th there were a lot of missing links there where it wasn't clear what the order of transitions were. And this was, again, food for critics. Well, you're saying these evolved, but how do you know? We don't have the evidence. Well, in that time, just in the last 40 years, this has been filled in amazingly. There's tons of them now. There's all these intermediate forms have filled in. It's just like that comic that you just saw on, or that uh, cartoon you just saw. Where, you know, people are finding these missing links. Now, these things don't jump out of the ground and present themselves to us. This is the result of a lot of hard work by paleontologists like Dr. Benton, where, you know, it, these things are not always going to be found and found easily. Nonetheless, we've had amazing success, and nothing has contradicted it. There's nothing where, you know, you see this dramatic jump with no explanation. There's always a series of intermediates in there. So this is, this is really strong support for this idea of, of transitions. Now, what we've talked about so far are actual predictions for evolution, but let me take it going the other way. What about retrodictions, as you might call them? 
These are things that we wouldn't necessarily predict ahead of time, but when we see them, they're like, wow, well, I can't think of any other explanation for that besides the sort of evolution by natural selection and, and gradual evolution rather than instantaneous appearance. Sorry. So one of them is the case of vestigial organs. So this is showing you the fossil, or I'm sorry, the, this is showing you the skeleton of a gray whale. Back here in the corner, it's got hind limbs. It's got hind limb bones, actually. It doesn't actually have hind limbs. Why would it have those bones? They serve no use. They're not attached to anything. They're just kind of floating in there. The answer is because the gray whale shares a common ancestry with forms that did live on land, which did have hind limbs. It lost those limbs, but the bones didn't completely go away. If something was just made to go into the ocean and, and do its thing, there would be no reason for it to have these particular hind limbs. However, when we think about it in the context of evolution, it makes a lot of sense, and specifically common ancestry in this case. Other examples, dead genes or vestigial genes. So we actually cannot produce our own vitamin C. We as, as primates cannot do that. Most primates can't do that. Just about all other mammals, with the exception of guinea pigs for some weird reason, can produce their own vitamin C. Nonetheless, if you actually sequence our genome, I'm just referring to this middle part, if you sequence our genome, we actually have the genes for making vitamin C in there, but they don't work anymore. Something happened. Anybody, anybody care to hazard a guess? Or a hypothesis, I should say. Yes? Exactly. That's exactly right. So the suggestion is we were eating enough fruit that when a mutation happened to break that gene, it, there was no selection against it. There was no reason for that mutation to be considered bad and wiped out. And eventually it just happened to spread through random forces. It probably wasn't adaptive. It just probably spread through some sort of random force. And then as, at now at some point we actually no longer make it. Pardon me? Why? Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's a good question. So the question is, why do, why do so many sailors get scurvy? Presumably the, in... That's true in our history, but not true in our ancient history. If you go back to the, you know, the ancient Greeks and Romans, they probably weren't living long enough to get scurvy. <laughs> the other thing, too, is you have olfactory receptor proteins. We, actually d we still make these. A lot of animals use them. I'm sorry, we still have them in our genome, but we do not make the proteins anymore. And that's why these people over here are not dead from, <laughs> from, sniffing, <laughs> from sniffing the underarms. We also have genes for making yolk proteins. We don't need those. But they're all there. This is, this is basically showing us, it's almost like a fossil record within our genome, showing us cases of what you know, our ancestors used but we no longer use. Again, this is not something you would necessarily have expected to see, but we do see it, and it, and it thus supports this idea. Oh, that actually, I actually have no idea where that came from. I just found it on Google Image Search. I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> I have to figure out a way to use that. <laughs> Oh, uh, basically, it just refines your sense of smell. So, you know, like, for example, your dog can always sniff and identify where you've been versus somebody else has been. So that's something we're incapable of doing. We don't actually have as many olfactory receptors. So, therefore, we're not nearly as good at distinguishing fine smells. Good question. Yeah. Oh, is that right? Okay, I didn't actually know that. So the, the gentleman here was saying that uh, young children can actually use it to smell their mother, but uh, we lose that sense after a while. That's good to know. Pardon me? As far as we know, no. I mean, the, the genes are there, but they're not actually functional. But as far as we know, no. I mean, we've got a placenta, so. <laughs> the, other, the other thing we see is the cases of biogeography. So this is basically using what we see on the planet to try to infer, you know, what animals are present where. And what's interesting is when you look at these sort of oceanic islands, so this is just a random picture of one there, you tend to see many native birds, and you see, tend to see many native insects, but what you almost never see are native mammals, amphibians, or freshwater fish. Why would that be? Again, if we have common ancestry, you know, how, would the, how would the freshwater fish have gotten to an oceanic island? There's no way for it to get there. How would the mammals have gotten there? How would the amphibians have gotten there? There's no way to get there. Or if some you know, group of wayward birds landed there and established a colony there, and then over the course of you know, a couple of thousand or a couple of million years, went on and became new species. So we don't see these native mammals, amphibians, or freshwater fish, but we do see native birds and insects. So, hmm? You don't see them anywhere else. That's the, typical, that's the typical explanation for it. If you don't see it anywhere else, we assume it's native. So the question then, somebody could say, well, maybe those islands are not well suited to amphibians or to mammals. Right? I mean, that would be an, that would be an obvious counter-argument. Well, 
we definitely see cases where that's not the case. So uh, here's uh, animals that, that ate Hawaii, so to speak. We have the invasion of cane toads and, and mongoose. Those of you from Australia, I know you, you're very familiar with the cane toads. They, they certainly could reproduce on these kinds of places, but they never had the opportunity. They never showed up in these places. So this is, again, a case where it, everything makes sense when we assume common ancestry. But if we assume things were just put down on the planet in particular locations, it doesn't really make as much sense. Or at least there's not an obvious plan to that. The other thing that we tend to see with, res with respect to biogeography is that, that the most similar species to those you see on these really isolated islands are usually found on the nearest mainland. So again, this makes sense where you know, if a wayward group of birds came uh, to this oceanic island, they're most likely to have come from the nearest mainland, not from, say, the opposite side of the planet or anything like that. This isn't, again, something you would expect ahead of time, but it's something that when you see it, you're like, wow, well, this makes a lot of sense with common ancestry and evolution. It doesn't make a lot of sense in other contexts. So one of the best cases that people like to talk about is the cases of actually inefficient design, where things really are not intelligently designed. So focus here first on the middle part of this picture. Here's, um, here's the fish and some of its uh, laryngeal nerves there. The nerve essentially loops around the aorta. You can't really see it very well because the picture is a little bit small there. But the, the nerve loops around the aorta and it comes up to, to essentially move the fish's mouth. This, this form is fine. Now, we have ancestors that were fish. So for us, it makes a lot less sense. Here it is coming from your brain, going down, looping around your aorta, coming back up to your larynx. Not very efficient at all, right? Really, really not efficient in the case of the giraffe, where it has to start up here, go all the way down, loop around the aorta, come all the way back up, <laughs> and, and control the larynx there. Really, really, really not efficient. But what happened is, as it says here, evolution worked with the materials available. You couldn't just design, you couldn't design a giraffe from scratch. If you were designing a giraffe from scratch, you would definitely eliminate this. However, given the giraffes evolved from fish ancestors far enough back, they couldn't start from scratch. They had to work with the materials that were available. So again, it makes sense in the, con in the context of common ancestry. It makes much less sense in the context of things just appearing. So what have we seen? We've seen examples of natural selection in real time, case in point being the, uh, the uh, peppered moth issue in the beginning. We've seen fossil records strongly supporting many predictions of evolution by natural selection. We have vestigial organs and vestigial genes. We have cases of biogeography supporting it with its retrodictions. Cases of inefficient design. All of these things are true. So the question people often throw back is, well, what would disprove it? What would falsify evolution? What would put a big X there on Darwin? Well, one of them, as I said earlier, fossils being in the wrong place, so mammals in the Devonian or, or fossil rabbits in the Precambrian. Haven't seen it happen, but that would falsify this idea. One is adaptations in one species that are only good. This, is, this word only is very important. Only good for a second species. We don't know of any cases of that. Though, actually, though uh, Kirk Cameron, who I mentioned the, in the previous lecture, he has this funny video where he, he talks about how the banana was designed specifically for humans. And look, it fits in our hand perfectly. And I'm not accepting that as one of those cases. <laughs> But you can actually find that on YouTube as well. If you see a general lack of genetic variation within species, you actually can't have evolution. Evolution by natural selection requires there to be variation. If variation never comes up, you can't have evolution by natural selection. If you see adaptations that couldn't have evolved by a step-by-step -step process, this is one that does come up quite a bit, and I'll show you some counterexamples to that in just a second. Evolved altruistic behavior among non-relatives and non-social animals. All right. And last but not least, any unexplained discordance between uh, relationships through phylogenies based on morphology and those based on DNA. Again, we really don't see that. I mean, every one that we see actually is fairly easily explainable. Now, what are some common criticisms? That's the thing I asked you guys to, th to think about earlier. Here's some of them that you may have actually encountered. One of them is too much change for evolution to explain. This is the, one of the most common things where s people say there's no way that man could come from a bacteria. There's no way you could get enough mutations. There's not enough time. It just would never happen. This is a common, uh, a common thing. Or they say, yeah, right, that wouldn't happen. <coughs> one is that you can't explain the complexity we see. For example, the eye. People always bring up the eye or the bacterial flagella, saying, well, half an eye wouldn't work. You cut it in half, it doesn't work. All right? Why isn't it still happening? There's the quote I told you yesterday. Why aren't monkeys still evolving into humans? So I actually should apologize. I attribute it to Michelle Bachman. It was actually Christine O'Donnell. <laughs> I apologize. I misattributed it. I'm sure Michelle Bachman would never have said that. 
<laughs> and last but not least, it does. Pardon me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> last but not least, it doesn't explain life origin or denies the existence of God. None of these are correct, and let me go over each of them, and then I'll come back to the sort of applications of, of uh, evolution. Are we good on time? I forget what time we're supposed to end. So, okay, we got lots of time. We're good. So the too much change idea. Let's talk about this for a second. So dogs were just domesticated a few thousand years ago. Oh, sorry, I'm blocking the picture. Dogs were just domesticated a few thousand years ago. Now, nonetheless, although dogs were domesticated that long ago, the breeds we tend to see, most of them are just a few hundred years old. But nonetheless, we see this amazing diversity here. Look at all these different kinds of dogs. And just think about other dog breeds you know. Most of those, not all, most of those were just from the last couple of hundred years. Let's, let's estimate for a second. Let's say that it happened over a thousand years. We'll just say that, okay? Hmm? Pekingese, there you go. We'll just say it happened over the course of a thousand years, okay? That you had this, this difference, say, between Chihuahuas and Pekingese and Great Danes. All right. Life on Earth, again, is estimated to be about three and a half billion years old. Okay, that's three and a half billion is more than a thousand, right? <laughs> now, the problem is, that I have this problem too, and, and, and a lot of people have this problem. It's hard to really conceive of that difference between three and a half billion and a thousand. I mean, you can multiply it. But how many times over could dog breeds have been done? How many times over is that? I mean, you can, get, you can figure out the exact number, but think about it. If a thousand years, that, that full length of time for making Great Danes and Chihuahuas and things like that, were one millimeter, three and a half billion would be three and a half kilometers. So just think about that for a second. You know, just imagine a millimeter right here. And now I'm going to go three and a half kilometers and count that out. That's going to take a really long time to do. But that really emphasizes the difference in scale we're talking about. That if you can have that much change in one millimeter, and you have three and a half kilometers, it really isn't that hard to then to think, wow, we well could pretty much have anything by the time you're on the other side of the room, much less you're three and a half kilometers away. Again, it's hard to relate to those numbers. We think a thousand is big, a million is big, a billion is big. They're all kind of big. But really, they're dramatically different. So this really could have happened. And what happened in the context of dogs, yes, that was artificial selection. But there's no difference between artificial selection and natural selection, except who's doing it. Right? The intensity is sometimes just as strong. Too much complexity is a big one. And the thing that comes up there is that intermediates really do exist, even in extant species. Right? For all the forms people talk about, the, bacteri the bacterial flagella, the, eye spot, the eyes, things like that. So things like, for example, euglena has a very simple eye spot photoreceptor. If you look among mollusks, there's amazing diversity in eye form. And you can actually see all sorts of intermediates between the, uh, between the more complex ones and the very basic ones, say, that clams have sticking out of their shells. They actually do have eyes. Uh, some of you don't. <laughs> so there, it, there really are the intermediates, even for those things that people toss out. like, oh, there really aren't. Actually, there really are. Why isn't it still happening? Why aren't chimps still evolving into humans? Well, <laughs> first of all, there, there's many incorrect assumptions. First, we didn't come from chimps. We and chimps shared a common ancestor. Another assumption here is that the formation of a new species means the old one is gone. That's not necessarily true. There's an assumed directionality that, you know, this is always better, so everything's moving that way. That's not always true. The new forms may be advantageous because they can actually go after different resources. We talked briefly last time about Darwin's finches. This shows you, look at the dramatic difference in beak shape. Each one actually eats a different, uh, each one eats a different kind of seed. So this one over here breeds off of cactus. This one, this one also does cactus. This is a seed eater. This one uh, is, has a woodpecker-like beak. This one right here eats insects. So you have all these dramatic different forms. Now what's adaptive is to have multiple of them. If everybody eater a cactus eater, that wouldn't actually be advantageous. It's actually better for some to go in this niche and some to go in that niche. So you don't necessarily have to get rid of one species just because you're forming another one. It's not like it's just better for everybody to go over there. In fact, many forms can be advantageous. Again, there's no directionality in evolution. History doesn't have to repeat itself, and I'll emphasize that in just a second. This is a common misconception that we have this sort of directionality in the, that we evolved from amoebae or we evolved from chimpanzees and things like that. That is not true. Humans and all these other species, again, share a common ancestor. That's not the same as evolving from them. It's, it's, it's just distinctly different. What's important here is that all species have changed relative to ancestral forms. Bacteria that are alive today have evolved for 3.5 billion years. Amoebae that are around today evolved for 3.5 billion years. We evolved for 3.5 billion years. We've all evolved the same amount of time. So the forms you see today are not the original form. They share a common ancestor with the original form. There are no quote-unquote higher beings. People like to think of this, that, you know, well, you have your, there's your plant, and then you go up to your ladybug, you go up to your fish, and there's your human at the top of the ladder. 
It's not true. It's not that everything is headed towards humanity. It's a very anthropocentric point of view, though I know we all fall into it. I f sometimes fall into it myself as well. But this is something that drives a lot of the, the public opinion. Any questions? Yeah. Sure. Ah, so the question is about the, the commonly said thing of uh, ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny, that when you look at embryology, you see a lot of ancestral forms. This was in initially int introduced by Haeckel in the uh, late 1800s. You actually see a lot of evidence for that. Now, Haeckel's drawings were uh, exaggerated slightly. You don't see it as perfectly as the, original, as the original perceptions of this suggested. But nonetheless, you do actually see you know, more similarity in in uh, embryonic forms among species than you, than you see in the adult forms. And that is suggestive of this idea that we do share a common ancestor. That's another good point. Yes? That's exactly right. So there's several cases like that where, where species that didn't have a particular need to change over time have actually largely stayed the same. Uh, you know, there's no reason to just randomly evolve. But you're trying, if you're going through natural selection, if you have a good form, as long as it's good, you're going to stick with that same form. So, of course, one of, the, one of the classic cases people talk about there is the coelacanth, right? You know, a vertebrate which has barely changed quite a bit. They call it a quote-unquote living fossil. Though it's barely living because they've only caught like three in the last, you know, 100 years or whatever. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah, horseshoe crab is another example of that. Pardon me? Yes, the eye is definitely not a perfect system, as anybody who has cataracts will tell you right now. Too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, it's true. That's true. If you were designing an eye, you wouldn't have put the blood vessels in front of it. No, it's another case where you don't have a f uh, in an, in an efficient design. If you were to design it, you would have designed it very differently. So there's a lot of issues there. The last one that I was going to talk about in this context is that it doesn't explain life's origin or denies the existence of God. This, people say this all the time. Now, the first part, actually, I'll say is somewhat true, that most evolutionary theory doesn't even try to address why or how life arose. It's, again, change through time. It's change through time of living beings over generations. Now, that transition from non-living to living is certainly extraordinarily important for evolution because that obviously started the process. But... It doesn't specific, most theory that's out there doesn't try to explain that. There are people who study that, but that's outside the realm of evolutionary biology. The second part is very much untrue. There's no intrinsic theism or atheism in anything we talked about. Again, it's, evolution by natural selection is just a mathematical inevitability. Now, there are many biologists out there who, who support evolution who are also very devout in faith. So Francis Collins, who's the director of our National Institutes of Health in the United States, he is a devout, born-again Christian. He nonetheless is very strongly supportive of evolution and of teaching of, uh, of evolution. There's also born-again atheists. I don't know what you call them. Dead always atheists. What do you think? <laughs> I don't know what you call them. <laughs> so, <laughs> Richard Dawkins being a, a great example in that context. <laughs> so there's really no intrinsic theism or atheism in it. It's just we're just explaining a process we're seeing out there. It's no different from studying gravity. But people tend to put it upon themselves to try to stick those two things together. It really doesn't have to do that. So the last part of my talk, and this, this is not especially short, but it's the last section of the talk, is how does studying evolution help humanity? This is the, this is the kind of thing that, that, so I teach evolution to uh, introductory biology students. The vast majority of them are pre-medical, as you can imagine. And they often come to me like, why do I need to know this? Is there any value to this? And I have to say yes, and it's not just because I'm teaching, I'm trying to keep my job. That's certainly important. But there really is a lot of value to it. Now, evolution is actually, or applications of evolutionary principles are out there. And sometimes it's, it wasn't even consciously uh, applied, but nonetheless, it's very much the same sort of thing. Quantitative genetics. Quantitative genetics is the field of study where people essentially assess the similarity between parents and offspring and try to figure out how much of that is heritable. How much of it is heritable? Now, many of you know, of course, we all look a little bit like our parents. We look more like our parents than we do a random person we grab from within this room, right? This has been known for millennia, and there's some traits that are more heritable than others. We'll actually talk about that quite a bit in my next lecture about uh, genetics and personal genomics. Well, this similarity has been applied in selective breeding in many cases. And we already talked about the case of dogs. Here's all your different dog breeds in the bottom right corner from your ancestral wolf-like form. Does anybody know what this is right here? Ancient corns, Teosinte. This is essentially what our modern corn came from. Look at that. I can't imagine who first decided, let me start breeding that, see if I can make some scrumptious yellow thing. 
<laughs> I'm glad they did, <laughs> but I can't imagine. How about this? This is an old, this is a mustard plant. It is the ancestor of cauliflower, broccoli, cabbage, kale, all these great foods that we tend to eat. I especially love broccoli, so that's one of my favorites. But they all came from this original mustard plant through a process of artificial selection, where people would say, I like this trait, I will breed the individuals that have that trait. That trait was heritable. It's no different from natural selection. These are the ugly guys here. Look at these pigeons. Well, that first pigeon's just normal, but look at those other crazy ones. This was the kind of thing, you know, Darwin was very much a pigeon fancier, and this, is the, this was one of the things which stimulated some of his ideas. But again, you can select for these crazy traits and crazy behaviors as well. It's not just morphology. So again, this quantitative genetics has been applied for, for thousands of years, but we just didn't call it evolution. We just did it. There's other examples, antibiotic resistance. So penicillin is great. It was mass produced for the first time in, in uh, 1943. It was discovered you know, about 15 years before that. Uh, this was an ad, actually, from uh, during World War II. Thanks to penicillin, he will come home. How many of you here in this room in the last five years uh, used penicillin for something? Not any antibody, but specifically penicillin. There's a couple. couple. Now, why weren't more people using that? Now, probably most of you here it's, uh, got sick in the last couple of years and used some sort of antibody. How many people used an antibiotic? Raise your hand. Yeah, just about the whole room. So what happened? Why did most of you not use penicillin? Well, hmm? It's evolution. That's exactly right. What happened is the first resistant strain of staph was found in 1947. So this was about four years after. So, yeah, okay, there's a resistant strain out there. But before this, this was the wonder drug. 1950, 40% of staph isolates were resistant, which is a little scary until you look at 1960. 80% of staph isolates were resistant to penicillin. That is a dramatic change. And now, if 80% had been uh, resistant to penicillin to, to start with, probably people wouldn't have even bothered mass producing it. They would have said, whatever, this is getting rid of 20% of infections. How did this happen? The answer, is, as somebody said, it was evolution by natural selection. Let me show you the process. Here's your original population there on the left. So let's imagine blue ones, like this one over here, are susceptible to penicillin. That essentially, if, if penicillin is applied to them, they die. Red ones are resistant. And that original population, most of them were susceptible to it. You had antibiotics applied. All the blue ones are gone. There's no competition for the resistance strain. So who spreads? The red ones. The resistance strain multiplied, and that's most of what you tend to see today. And what happened, this was, this was actually something unfortunate. What happened is that antibiotics were applied in many cases. They still are applied when we didn't really need them. So what's happened is that people have killed off all the not resistant strains and allowed the, I'm sorry, yeah, I said that right, I said that right. They killed off all the not-resistant strains and have allowed the resistant ones to multiply for many antibiotics. And it's because these antibiotics are overprescribed. So for those of you, I know many of you here are physicians, please avoid it as much as possible. I know it's hard when the person's sitting there and then potentially going to get sick, but please avoid antibiotics as much as possible. There are many antibiotics now that no longer work. There's very few that are universally effective, where, where there used to be tons. So it's, it's a big danger of what's going to happen in the near future. Now, antibiotics are kind of interesting in that they've also affected our, our, our yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've wondered about that, actually. So the question here was, uh, are you going to see anti-Purell strains out there? I've wondered about whether that may be the case. Now, there's some things which probably, there has to be some genetic variation for it. So something like Clorox. It's very unlikely that it's going to be a strain of bacteria that's actually resistant to Clorox because it's very unlikely there will be a single mutation or even a couple of mutations which should actually let it get all the way there. Purell, I'm less convinced about it. I think that there may be some way to get around that. So that's a very good question. So we've had, we've had a lot of co-adaptation with good microbes, and this is something which is important to, to think about in the context of this application of antibiotics. Now, we've co-evolved with many bacteria, and they synthesize our vitamin K. Bacteria in our gut do this. They help us to resist invading organisms, and they affect regulation of, of stomach hormones. So when we apply antibiotics, we're killing the good stuff as well as killing the bad stuff. Many of you know this, that you know, people are more prone to, for example, getting yeast infections when they're on antibiotics. Now, this right here, is, this right here on the side is from a 2011 study. This sh is showing a very troubling correlation. When you're looking at the, the risk of inflammatory bowel disease in kids based on the number of courses of antibiotics they've had. So the risk is very low for those who've had no antibiotics. It's much higher for, for those who've had multiple courses of antibiotics. It's not 100% proven what's going on here, but this suggests that we've killed off good gut bacteria. We're continuing to do so. 
there's some risk that if we completely kill them off, that, that the diseases, not the ones we're, we're trying to avoid with antibiotics, but other diseases will be uh, cropping up because we're killing off the good microbes that we co-evolved with. So it's, again, not thinking in the context of our evolution that has uh, potentially negative medical implications. Any questions? Is that right? Oh, okay. Oh, yes, I have heard about that. Yes, there are definitely several cases where uh, courses of antibiotics have been associated with increased allergies. Yes. Sure. Oh, yeah, whether, whether they would lose the resistance or not. There are, many cases, there are many cases that they do lose resistance. The reason for that is often there's a cost associated with having the resistance. Now, that cost is not, so, is not as bad as being killed. So that's the reason that, you know, for, and we actually I see this in the laboratory, for example. I work with E. coli when I'm trying to do some cloning. And if you use ones that have a, um, a plasmid with ha which has antibiotic resistance, they never reproduce as well as those that don't have the plasmid because there is this cost to producing the ex extra defenses. So that's a good question. Yeah. Probi this is actually, this suggests that the use of probiotics would be good in this case, especially their natural pro probiotics with which we had co-evolved. This would support that idea. No, it's, it's very interesting because all this comes together in an evolutionary context that isn't necessarily always appreciated. Obviously, people here in this room do, but uh, in the broader public, it's not always appreciated yet. Is that right? Ah, so it sounds like this is also important in the context of uh, stomach cancer. But essentially, the number of courses of antibiotics is, uh, is associated with uh, increased incidence of stomach cancer. Sorry, my handwriting's a little bad. <laughs> Not true? Oh, okay. Well, you guys can talk about it. <laughs> I hadn't heard that before. <laughs> so what I wanted to close out the talk with is two little vignettes, two little stories about uh, evolution and, and applications of it to either understand ourselves or to affect you know, humanity for the, for the better. So the first one I'll talk about is the control of mosquito spread of dengue using intracellular bacteria. This is a, this is a procedure that's going on now. Now, obviously pest and disease control is really important. And dengue fever, as you all know, is spread by mosquitoes, these lovely individuals. It's one of the leading causes of child death in Southeast Asia. 40% of the world is at infection. And there's many epidemics that have happened, including in the Americas, even as recently as 2009. So this is happening a lot. Now, what do people do? People try to spray. It's not particularly effective, but it's better than nothing. Try to avoid mosquitoes. So, for example, putting out nets. That is a good way of doing it, but it's not perfect. There's no vaccine. So what do we do? Completely so this is happening in one side of the world. This is, you know, say the, we'll call it the medical side. On the evolutionary side of the world, they're not thinking at all about this, but there's a group of researchers led by especially Michael Torelli and Ari Hoffman. Ari Hoffman's in Australia and Torelli's at the University of California, Davis. They're studying Wolbachia bacteria. These are an intracellular parasite. I'm going to link these two stories in just a second. There, this is an intracellular parasite found in almost all insect species studied. Okay? So it's found in, within its cells. It's passed on through the egg, so it's passed on mother to offspring. This is a very important feature. Just mother to offspring is the way it's passed on. Interesting what happens is you get no offspring if you mate an infected male with an uninfected female. So what I have here in, in this, little, uh, this little box plot on the side, here's, here's females in the columns. So here's an infected female and uninfected female. Here's infected male and uninfected male. Infected with infected is fine. Infected female with uninfected male is fine. Uninfected female with infected male, that's the one that produces no offspring. Whereas if both are uninfected, it's fine. So everything is fine there except for the case for a mating between an infected male and an uninfected female. I'm not exactly sure what goes wrong. There's something about the, the Wolbachia in the sperm attack the egg in some way. I forget exactly what the problem is from it, but it makes it so you don't get any offspring. That's obviously bad for the female, right? Bad for the male, too. So what would we predict? Looking at that chart, focusing on the columns, now imagine a population that some males are infected and some males are uninfected. Okay, just hypothetically speaking. Is it better for a female, so looking at the columns here, is it better for a female to be infected or is it better to be uninfected? Infected. It's much better to be infected. So this is an interesting thing that's happened. This was studied initially in fruit flies, in Drosophila simulans, and uh, an infection came into Drosophila simulans, pff, I think they estimated something like 
30 years ago or something like that. It's completely spread across the entire United States now. And the reason for it is it's better for females to be infected than uninfected. For males, it's actually better to do the opposite, but it's never passed on through males, so that doesn't matter. So the only thing that matters is what's happening in the context of females. This r dramatically, quickly spread across North America. It didn't really do anything. Nobody really noticed. It didn't change anything for any of us. Now, what's happened is that people have thought about this in the context of those mosquitoes. In 2009, there were two very important papers about this. One of them found that you could introduce slightly life-shortening Wolbachia into mosquitoes. Notice I say slightly life-shortening. If, if it killed them immediately, it would be very disadvantageous, right, obviously. But it's slightly life-shortening. What happens is the, the mosquitoes still reproduce. You still get more mosquitoes. Sorry. <laughs> However, they die before they are actually uh, able to transmit dengue. They don't actually transmit it for like the first 12 days or something like that of adulthood. So they die a little bit earlier, but they still reproduce. So the cost is pretty minimal. But remember, there's that big benefit to being infected. There was another study which showed that being infected with Wolbachia inhibits other viruses from infecting the host. So what would happen if we introduced Wolbachia into mosquitoes? Could we actually spread it out and make it so they can no longer transmit dengue? Well, this is the idea, and this is something that's actually being pursued right now. In fact, this year, there were controlled, cross, or controlled releases of mosquitoes into Queensland in Australia. This was a test case. It's not like there's tons of dengue there. This was a test case just to see if it would work. The picture here on the bottom shows uh, the number of, of releases. These are different days. And it shows the percentage of the population that was infected with Wolpachia. And look at that. By 100 days after the, first, uh, after the first set of releases, all the mosquitoes that they collected were infected with Wolbachia. It spread dramatically. The idea now, and this is something they're just beginning, is to go into Southeast Asia and just release tons and tons of mosquitoes with Wolbachia and hopefully dramatically reduce the incidence of dengue. Now, this is great because this is an evolutionary study that was not done in the context of this medical application, but it was just pure science. But nonetheless, its outcome may be to reduce or even potentially eliminate dengue. And it's leveraged the evolution research. And this outcome could have essentially uh, affect 40% of the world's population. Absolutely. <laughs> There's been, th so this has been in the works now for many years. They've been checking it very carefully. Now, obviously, there's some risk. Flip side is not doing it also has a pretty big risk. It's not like something that's, that, that's just hypothetical. But, yeah, I mean, I know especially those of you who are Australians who may be thinking, like, isn't that what they said when they released the cane toads? <laughs> there's definitely some worry about that. But as far as they know, they can't see anything wrong with it. So cross your fingers. Maybe it'll be really good. Hopefully not very bad. But I love this example because this is a great uh, case of application of an evolutionary study for the human good. So the last vignette I'm going to tell you about is understanding lac uh, human evolution of lactose tolerance, or essentially the opposite of lactose intolerance. Who in here is lactose intolerant? I'm just curious. A fair number of you. Okay. So I have some good news for you. The, the ancestral condition is lactose intolerance. All the rest of you who didn't raise your hands, we're all mutants. <laughs> the mutant condition is lactose tolerance. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with lactose intolerance, this is where you produce extreme painful gas when you, when you pr uh, consume milk products. And this typically happens when you're more than five years old. Why not less than five years old? Mother's milk, exactly. Now, if, if people were lactose intolerant at a very young age, say at like, you know, two months old, that would be something that was strongly selected against. In contrast, since there's, you know, most people are not nursing by the time they're seven, there was no selection against it turning off. What, what happens, just if you want to know the genetical means for it, is we still have the lactase gene. Everybody who is intolerant or tolerant has the lactase gene, but the promoter on it essentially switches off with age and switches off somewhere between, say, 5 years old and 20 years old. It's not always the same, but there was never any sort of, huh? What's that? Oh, yeah, sorry. The, the addition there was that's true in all mammals, not just in, I think I said in humans, but it's true in all mammals as well. There's no selection against having it turn off because of that. Now, if you look today, the incidence of it varies w quite a bit. So there's only about 1% of the Dutch that are, that are uh, lactose intolerant, 12% when you look at European Americans. It's quite a bit higher in African Americans and very high in Southeast Asians. So what happened? How did this change come about from this ancestral condition of intolerance to the mutant condition of tolerance? Well, there was a great study in, in 2003 which, which elaborated this. In Europe, about 7,500 years ago, they estimated this very precisely, there was a mutation that occurred that allowed the production of lactase enzyme in adults. 
And this perfectly coincides with the onset of dairy usage. So as people started having access to dairy, there was a distinct advantage to being able to eat it and not have extremely painful gas. Maybe you had more kids because you weren't, your stomach wasn't hurting. Something like that. <laughs> I mean, it never killed you or anything like that, but obviously this was something that was a good thing because you had more access to nutrients that didn't hurt you. So this was advantageous and it spread. And interesting, what people have done is they've actually gone back to European fossils and actually extracted DNA from them, and you do not see this mutation there. So we can actually date it both by molecular means, but also confirm it using, fossil, or using uh, DNA from fossils. And these are fossils that are not that old. They're 7,500 years ago old. They're not ancient or anything like that. This shows you actually a picture of approximately where they've estimated it started. So kind of in Central Europe there, expanded out. So it sounded like that was the end of the story. But remember I said it's quite a, it's quite a bit different in terms of incidents around the world. It's not just that it arose in Europe, and Europe was the center of all good. There was actually a different mutation in Africa. There's a completely different one. It's still in the lactase gene, but it's not the same mutation. It still had the same effect nonetheless. It still makes it so lactase production doesn't turn off with age. Uh, in this case, it happened about 5,000 years ago, and this later date coincides with later cattle domestication in East Africa than in Europe. They've also done a lot of evolutionary modeling to try to understand what the advantage was, and they, said, they suggested it increased your offspring production by about 5%. Not directly, but this is the, the outcome of having that. Okay, so it sounds like now they've explained it. Well, as a matter of fact, they hadn't, because there's yet another origin of lactase persistence in the Middle East, in my ancestors. In this case, it's a weird one where it's an effect of two mutations together. You actually don't see it with either one by itself. So this is a case, again, of not particularly efficient design. We're a little behind the Middle East, sorry. <laughs> there's evidence in this case that it may have actually been in response to camel milk production, uh, consumption rather than cow's milk. Again, it makes sense. There's probably other mutations, too. These are just the ones that have been described. In every case, it's found in the lactase gene, but it's a different nucleotide, it's a different base change that had the same effect in a place where it was needed. And it didn't come out in response to that need, but when the mutation happened, it was grabbed by natural selection when the need was there. Okay? Yes? That's not exactly the same as co-evolution. This, this would be uh, what's referred to as convergent evolution. So similar. Yes? Oh, they didn't test them for lactose intolerance. They tested them for presence of the mutation. Yeah, you can, you can. Uh, yeah, there's some material on some of them. I assume what they did is they, they ground up some teeth and pulled out the DNA from the center of those. That's what I assume they did. I don't remember specifically, but I would assume that's it. I mean, that's the kind of thing they did, for example, with Neanderthal when they found out the, the ancient bones and bur uh, uh, drilled into them to pull it out. So does somebody say something over here? I thought I heard something. Oh, okay. Yeah. It could very well be. So the, the comment here was it may not have been trained just in breeding capabilities, but it may have been, uh, what, was it, what was the last part? The dependence on dairy. Exactly. Exactly. That if you didn't have the dairy, then you didn't have enough food, and therefore <laughs> you couldn't go forward. So this is really cool, but this, again, is another case where we see it. Now, this is a case of applying evolutionary genetics for lactase persistence in humans, where it's, this is associated with, I guess you could call it a medical condition, sort of medical. <laughs> In this case, it started with genetic mapping. This is how they originally found it. They mapped it down to say, oh, look, that must be the lactase gene. They identified multiple independent origins. They identified the strength of selection. Now, it's not huge selection, but it's still pretty strong. A 5% survival advantage over a short period of time will, will very, very quickly spread. <coughs> they coupled this genetic data with evolutionary analysis to date the mutation. And the best part is they inferred the cause from anthropological data, where you see these urns of milk coming, around, coming in around the exact same time. So this is really cool, and this ties things together very well. So coming back to, you know, how are evolutionary insights applied to help, or, uh, uh, help us understand humanity? Again, as I, I always like to tell my students, it ain't all math and dinosaurs. They tend to sometimes feel that way. But we have quantitative genetics being a big part. We have selection on microbes. We have the two vignettes I told you. But there's many, many, many other examples out there. Evolutionary thinking permeates a lot of biology. As Theodosius Dubzhansky, the Russian geneticist, said at one point in time, nothing in biology makes sense. That's not the end of it, except in light of evolution. So there you go. And of course, hmm? except in light of evolution. Nothing in biology makes sense except in light of evolution, except when you think about it in an evolutionary context. The other thing, of course, the uh, evolution is cool when you look at the merchandise out there. <laughs> I, like the, I like the bumper sticker in the middle there. Evolution is only a theory, just like um, gravity. <laughs> 
So with that, I'm happy to take some of your questions. Thanks for having me. I think we got about, about 10 minutes or so. Yeah. That's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. So the question was uh, whether there have been corresponding studies in the context of diabetes with sucrose and glucose, things like that. I actually don't know about that. That's a good question. Sickle cell disease is a very good example. So for those of you who aren't familiar with that, sickle cell is very cool. Well, it's not, it's not cool. <laughs> Bad way to put that. Sorry. Let me, let me draw out what that looks like. So in the case of sickle cell, this is a, this is a weird case that's referred to as overdominance, where there, there's, there's two distinct forms. We'll just call them big A and little a, right? So, oops. Oh, hang on one sec. There we go. So here's three possible genotypes. So this is in the context of sickle cell disease. So th let's say the, the capital letters or lowercase letters are different forms of a gene, or different alleles of a gene. So let's call little a, little a. These are the ones that have sickle cell anemia. Oops. This is obviously bad. This is very debilitating. Right? This is not a disease you'd want to have. It's genetically controlled, one gene involved. Uh, these guys over here are normal, and these guys over here are normal. So even if you have one copy of the sickle cell thing, you, some people refer to that as having sickle cell trait. Uh, you're normal, and if you're big A, big A, you're also normal if you don't have any, either copy. The interesting thing that's associated with this is that uh, the big A, little a's, with the ones that have one copy, are also um, less susceptible to malaria. Just the big A, little a ones. I mean, that may be true for sickle cell anemia p individuals, but that's not a, it's not a case where you'd want to be, you'd not want to have that trait even for that. These ones here, the big A, big A's, will get malaria, but they don't have sickle cell disease. So what happened here is very interesting. So where do you tend to see malaria? Where in the world do you see malaria? Yeah, the tropics. So let's say, for example, we'll use Africa as an example, but it's, but it's obviously in other places as well. If you look in Africa, the fraction of little a, uh, the fraction of um, the little a allele is fairly high in Africa. In contrast, in say like the United States, it's extraordinarily low, especially when you, when you look at uh, people who didn't come fairly recently from Africa. The reason for that is because of this case right here. That essentially, the, the people in Africa, by having that allele present, right, by having that allele present, they actually have this uh, resistance to malaria, so a less susceptibility to malaria. So that's allowed that to persist, even though some individuals then who, who get this if, if you have a kid from somebody who's big A, little a, right, one quarter of your offspring will be, unfortunately, little a, little a. But the allele persists nonetheless, even though some of your kids will actually get uh, sickle cell anemia. Now, if you took out, if you took out this uh, susceptibility to malaria, let's say, for example, malaria didn't matter, if malaria was eradicated, or you're in a population that doesn't have malaria, then there's no advantage whatsoever, and the whole population goes to big A. But in populations where you have malaria, you have this, this continuance of the little a form. So that's the example that the gentleman in the back was talking about. It's another cool example of, of evolution, but it's an unfortunate one because it has a bad side effect. Yeah? Yes. Exactly. And, yeah, exactly. Very true. So the, the comment here was that it illustrates how bad malaria is in places where it has it that you can afford if you're a big A little a individual to mate with a, another big A little a individual and have a quarter of your kids not make it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Numbers bear out very well. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's still prevalent, yeah. Have a lot more of it. Huh? I didn't know that. That's really cool. So the example the gentleman here was saying is that if you look in Af uh, 
people who came from Africa and either went to the, the North Amer or the Central American tropical area versus uh, the United States, the continuance of that little allele is much higher in the Central American tropics, okay. where malaria is present. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. I didn't know about that. That's really cool. You guys are teaching me as much as I'm talking about. <laughs> That's great. Other thoughts? Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> so the question is like, is evolution directed towards increasing intelligence? If increasing intelligence will make you have more kids, then certainly it will predispose you to it. Now, that's not necessarily always true. <laughs> Sometimes decreasing intelligence may actually let you have more kids in some cases. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. Yeah, it's type 2 diabetes. That's a good question. So the question is, is you know, the, the incidence of, of type 2 diabetes in young children, something that's an outcome of evolution. I think it is, but not in the, not in the good way. I think in that, you know, the, the way that if you look at our ancestors, they didn't have diets anywhere similar to what we had. If they had had diets similar to what we had over the course of a long time, I think you would see a lot less incidence of type 2 diabetes in children because there would have been some very strong selection against that. There would have been some, you know, some sort of adaptation that allows you to digest amazing amounts of fat and sugar, <laughs> which, <laughs> which, which we've never had in our evolutionary history, and that's probably why you're seeing this sort of response. No, that's good. Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't hear the, the, have there been any studies to correlate? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. I actually avoided that, but yes, there, there definitely, there's an, there's a almost perfect correlation with, uh, with uh, religious fundamentalism. There's almost perfect correlation between disbelief in ev evolution and religious fundamentalism. It, it, it's like, I mean, the correlation coefficient would be like 1, 1.0. It's, it's very, very tight, which is unfortunate. Because like I said, I like to try to dissociate those things as much as possible. But unfortunately, a lot of people have tied them together. Certainly for the Muslims, it's still true. Uh, I don't know. I don't know about. Jews. I mean, there, isn't, there aren't that many Jews in the world. I mean, Christians and Muslims sort of dominate the planet overall. I seriously doubt it's true in the context of, say, like you know, Taoists and Bu Buddhists and things like that. I, I don't know. I haven't seen numbers on that, but I wouldn't see any reason why that would necessarily have to be true. But certainly for both Christians and Muslims, it's very much true. Yeah. I'm sorry, say that again. There would be some. Mm -hmm. so, it sounds good. <laughs> sounds good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wish there were more acceptances, that's for sure. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ah. Good question. So the question was about the, the evolution of altruism in social animals. Now, typically when you see altruism, there, there's a couple of different ways it could happen. The most common way is where it's, quote, unquote, not true altruism, but you're actually helping individuals who are related to you. So, for example, you give a warning call, but the reason you're giving a warning call is, is that your relatives are nearby. And therefore, by giving the warning call, though you may sacrifice yourself, you're going to save enough other individuals that your genes are actually better off. Uh, J.B.S. Haldane, who I mentioned before, said... Uh, I think his famous quote was something like, I'd, I'd gladly give my life to save two brothers or eight cousins. That was based on his relationship. <laughs> I don't know if he actually would have done that, but <laughs> this is at least his statement in that context. There are other conditions where you could have it, and one of them is reciprocal altruism, that if your probability of encountering this individual again is fairly high and risk is fairly high, then it actually is good for you to go ahead and, and uh, not – you know, kill yourself or anything like that, but to actually maybe give up something that is valuable in hopes that when you need it, you'll get it back. There has to be uh, punishment for refusing to do so. So one famous example of this is vampire bats. 
what they'll do is they'll actually in the in their you remember they they most bats uh, are fairly social and they'll live together in these big uh, communities. What vampire bats will do is if if one member is really underfed, they'll go and regurgitate blood into his mouth in hopes that if they then need need blood, they'll, you know, get barfed back or something like that. So <laughs> but, again, you tend to see it in these cases of specifically these social animals where the probability of encountering the same individual again is high, and you can punish them if they don't give you back <laughs> the resources you need. Those are the kinds of situations where you have this sort of altruism going on, or it can be reciprocal. But the more common one is kin selection, where you're essentially you're helping out your relatives. Good question. Yeah. Uh, I said altruism went where basically there is no long-term benefit. So in this case, there is a long-term benefit either to your genes through your, through your relatives or to yourself through the, the high probability of getting paid back. Yeah? When there is not long-term benefit, you mean? When there is long-term benefit. Yeah, that's, that's true. At that point, it's not really altruism. It's true. Yeah, no, it's true. And you could argue that. You could say that really there is no absolute true altruism, that you're always getting something back, at least from an evolutionary sense. Yeah. Now, that's true. That you could have something which is essentially part of a trade-off, where it's better to do this and that, and you can't separate the two things. And it's because the, 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 the package, so to speak, is better than not having the package. Now, if there's no advantage, that's different than having a disadvantage. If there's no advantage, then certainly that could happen. If there's an actual disadvantage, then the advantage that's associated with it has to you know, outweigh that disadvantage. So that's a good point. Yeah, one last question. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, they have a lot of inbreeding, I, so I assume, right? So you have a lot of traits associated with that. No. Yeah. I guess those two will compensate uh, if your if your average number of kids is high. <laughs> That's great. All right. Well, I'll, I'll let you guys go because I know some of you want to go off and do some other stuff, but I'll be I'll have the the one-on-one -on -one session uh, tomorrow. Thank you all very much.